Cool. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Adrian. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about myself and my background a bit later on. Uh, but I'm going to be taking uh, part of the prototyping part of the, well, yeah, the prototyping course anyway. Um, and Niels, who you saw yesterday, will be taking some of it as well. So just to start off, uh, just a bit of a sort of, I guess, a refresher. So Rob talked about this stuff um, yesterday, but just to cover again. Um, so some of you guys are here as part of the MHIP degree. Some of you aren't. Um, that's fine. It doesn't really, really matter in the grand scheme of things, but uh, historically, probably these first few slides need updating. Um, originally, we didn't have people who weren't taking MHIT, so if you're not taking MHIT, this isn't relevant to you, so just feel free to ignore it. But the idea behind the MHIT degree, anyway, is that uh, we're looking at teaching user experience design. Um, so there's a, obviously a talk component of that. Uh, there's going to be some assignments, so in this course we'll probably give you three assignments. Uh, then there's the project week, so Rob touched on these, I know, but basically there's going to be two separate uh, periods in the, in the course where you'll have no lectures or anything, but you'll be stuck, put into groups and you'll basically be working on a project. Um, so I think one's about halfway through and it'll be a week long block and then the other one's right at the end of the course and there's three weeks and you'll be working with a, on an industry uh, partner's project effectively. So Rob has an industry partner that he's working with and you'll basically be working with them to do Ideally, it's kind of supposed to be like a little mini thesis. So it puts into practice all the stuff that you learn in both 602 and 603 um, to give you a taste of what it's like so that you guys can sort of hopefully make all the mistakes that you're likely to make before you start your thesis so that when you actually get started, uh, you know, you sort of know what to look out for and know what, where, your, where your strengths are, where your areas of improvement are so we can sort of try and get you guys as ready to start your thesis as possible. And that's sort of the whole reason why the HitLab's kind of special as well in that we, a lot of uh, master's degrees around the university don't have a taught component. You basically, you finish your undergrad and you go into the master's and you're just doing straight research. Because the, the HitLab is very multidisciplinary, um, we take in people from all walks, all backgrounds. We have these taught components in the hopes that regardless of whether you're from engineering, from science, from arts, from um, psychology, you name it, you can come here and hopefully get enough knowledge to at least know where you need to work um, to get your, your masters. You don't just come in, we sit you at a desk and say, all right, see you in a year and a half and, you know, hopefully you're all done. Um, so don't, don't look at these, as Rob was saying yesterday, don't look at these as, you know, oh, I've got to get a, an A to pass and, you know, got to make sure I tick the boxes. Um, obviously, you know, if, as Rob said, if any of you are on scholarships, there is that aspect of it for you. But the way we sort of see these, or the way at least I see these courses, is it's really a crash course for you guys to try and get you up to speed with everything you need to know for your thesis, or at least get you up to speed with, so you know where your strengths and weaknesses lie, so that you can either, um, you can tailor your thesis to work on those strengths, or you can uh, look at what you need to learn or what you need to get more experienced in your weaknesses, or alternately find a partner in a project um, who can help you with that. So uh, we've had a few questions about thesis and Rob will cover this all in a lot more detail on Friday, but I've talked to a couple of you guys sort of before lecture started and there was a few questions sort of about the thesis around, you know, does it have to be your own individual work and stuff? At the end of it, you have to submit your own individual thesis, but you, that doesn't mean you're working in isolation. So you can be working with on a larger project and as part of the, uh, we're gonna have a thesis week at some point in time, which again will be no lectures. And as part of that, we're going to hopefully get all the uh, PhD students to come in and talk about their research and areas that you guys might be interested in working in so that that way you, you're basically not being dumped on a project with a supervisor who you see two hours a week. Instead, you're working with someone who's also working on that full time so that you get a, a smaller chunk of a larger project and you basically get a full time, not assistant, because you're probably more of the assistant to them than vice versa, but you get someone who's, um, you know, who's gonna be there 100%, can answer your questions, can help you out with the stuff that you guys don't need to know. And of course, you will still get an academic supervisor as well, but you know, you get an, you share an academic supervisor with a bunch of students, whereas ideally if we can partner you on a project with a PhD student, they're there for you 100% of the time. Um, so yeah, the thesis projects, ideally uh, usually working with industry, 
Uh, that has a number of benefits. Um, if we are able to squeeze some money out of them, obviously, you know, that helps out you guys. And Rob's pretty good at squeezing money out of people, so, you know, hopefully, I'm not sure quite where he's at with the, the projects at the moment, but if, if he's able to, you know, obviously, some of that money goes to you guys to help support, uh, to support you. Um, obviously, working in industry is much nicer to put on your CV. If you want to go out and get a job in industry later, you can say, oh, I work with these guys. And we've actually had a number of students who have worked with industry and done a really good job, and then they basically work, walk straight out of their masters into continuing their research as that job. So, um, you know, that's Rob, Rob sort of handles the thesis side of things, so I can't say what he has in the pipeline at the moment, but hopefully uh, there'll be stuff for all of you guys who are doing the MHIT degree um, that he can stick you in with, uh, with a thesis or an industry-sponsored project. So what we are hoping that you guys will learn is how to develop better user experiences. So we say user experiences, it's kind of this catch-all phrase. It's not a user interface because you might not be doing anything with a user interface. Um, it's not a, a product because you might not be like building a physical product. Really what, what we're concerned with in human interface technology is the human part of that, basically making the technology interface with them. And when Rob came in, he changed the lab's um, slogan, I guess, to, or lab's motto, to putting people before, before technology, which is kind of quite clever. I'm not sure if it was deliberately so, but you know, putting people before is in we, we put more importance on the person rather than the technology, but putting people before us and putting them in front of it as well. Um, and that's, that's really, when the HIT lab sort of first started, it was very much a, a high tech engineering, um, you know, pure maths and science sort of thing. And uh, there was a few core competencies in the lab and th those have still continued on, so things like AR and VR. However, uh, they, and I've been at the lab for a very long time, longer than anyone actually now, which is a bit sad. Um, but the, the hit lab used to sort of treat, um, there's an old, old saying, you know, when you've got a new hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the hit lab was very much like that. It's like, oh, let's do this with AR, and let's do that with AR, and let's do this with, AR. and it's like, it was, you know, very early days of AR and VR and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of that, sort of experimenting needed to be done to try and figure out exactly what, where it worked, what it was good for, and what it wasn't. Um, however, a lot of the times that ended up on some pretty pointless sort of projects. It's like, oh, I did this in AR, and you'd be like, but why? <laughs> um, and it's actually really interesting. So I, I actually, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but I actually um, spun out a company from the HitLab with a few other guys who were doing their PhDs at the same time as I did. And so I'm actually only uh, employed by the university one day a week. Um, so why I ended up doing lectures two days a week, I'm not quite sure how they swindled that, but um, I am here all the time. I sit just there, and the two guys who sit next to me are part of my company. Um, but yeah, like having moved from the academic research side to the industry side, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, industry is about 10 years behind everything that's at least 10 years. Um, you know, obviously parts of it are going really well, but I went to a, uh, a launch party for a head mounted, a new augmented reality head mounted display, uh, it's probably about five years ago, up in the, the hills above San Francisco. And it was this, this company which had raised just a, an obscene amount of money to build this stuff. And this party was like just ridiculous, like every, like no, no expenses spared. It was obscene. And then they had their big demo show reel that they showed at the end. And it was supposed to be, everyone was supposed to be like, oh, wow, that's so amazing. And so there was myself and Julian, and I think Rob was there actually. This was before he started working at the Hit Lab, and Mark, who was the original founder and director of the lab. And the four of us were sort of sitting there going, this is absolute garbage. Like, <laughs> this is stuff we did 10 years ago and found out that there's no point to it. It's like, um, oh, look, we can see a, a 3D model of a car floating in front of us. And it's like, but we've done all the user studies, we've done the user experiments. Like, just having a visualization of a car doesn't really give you much above just seeing a video of it or seeing a 3D model of it on the screen that you can spin around and look at. Apart from the fact that you've got to wear this big clunky headset and, you know, if I want to see the other side of it, rather than just clicking and dragging and spinning a 3D model around, I've actually got to physically walk all the way around it. And they had, like, these interaction designs, and they're showing people, like, waving their arms around. 
It's like, have you guys actually tried to do that for longer than 30 minutes? Because I can tell you it is exhausting. There is a reason that we have keyboards and mice that we can just go like that, because humans are intrinsically lazy. No one wants to be waving their arms around to control a computer um, for you know, eight hours a day. And Rob you know, goes on about that a lot with his uh, you know, comfortable VR stuff. So yeah, how to, uh, you, you'll notice in my talks I often get quite sidetracked. Um, so if I'm, if I'm get, uh, you know, too far away from the topic, do feel free to tell me to get back on topic. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're hoping you guys will develop better user experiences. You might not be necessarily building a physical product, uh, building some software. It might be that you're looking at something existing and trying to say, why doesn't this work? And how can we make it work? So it's all about that user's experience with the technology. What, what is it? What are the pain points? What's not working? What is working? How can we make things work better? Some of that will be really basic stuff, like uh, if we change it from a drop-down menu to having buttons, like Microsoft did in Microsoft Word. You know, all, all the things used to be hit up in little drop-down menus, and then they changed all the buttons. Everyone hated it when they did it, but Microsoft spent probably hundreds of thousands of dollars and thousands of hours testing this, and actually found, hey, most people don't use stuff because they have no idea where it is. Like, they see a bunch of menus, and they're like, oh, I'm just not going to do it. So putting it in big buttons, you know, all the power users are like, mm, this is stupid but it worked for more novice users because they can look at and they can go, oh, that looks like something that I might be interested in. Practical tools for design prototyping. So this year, um, because Anthony is a visiting academic and he's taken over the design course, uh, we've spent a bit of time over the past few weeks sort of rejigging where some of the material fitted into. So there was uh, a lot more low fidelity design prototyping in this part of the course that Anthony has now taken over, which I'm really glad of because that's not my strength. And also sort of was always a bit like, it just felt a bit awkward, like I've tr tried numerous places and ways to fit it in the lectures and it never quite felt right. So I think Anthony's gonna do a much better job at that, which is actually quite good because I always 100% appreciate any feedback you guys can give. If there is something that is working, please let me know. If there is something that is not working, please let me know. Uh, as far as these lectures go, I'm not here to fail you guys. I'm not here to you know, be the big thing. I'm trying to help you guys learn what you need to know to, to get where you need to get. So if something that I'm doing, I'm teaching isn't helping, if there's something I could be doing better, please let me know. As part of that, the last group who came through um, were generally pretty positive in their feedback, which is always good, uh, but they did say that they um, struggled with the, the software side of things. So I've deliberately set aside probably about another three lectures worth of time for the, the software side. We're gonna change up, there was a, some things rather than going, having it more in a sort of lecture format like we're doing now, it was more, of, I tried some more tutorials where everyone brought their laptops in and we worked through some problems together and they seem to appreciate that. So does everyone here have a laptop? Yeah. Or something that they can, doesn't have to be super powered? Yeah, does anyone not have a laptop that they can bring in? No, cool, all right, that's good. So we, when we get to the software prototyping, I will ask you guys to bring in your laptops. Um, there will still be slides, we'll still be working through things, but hopefully if you guys are sitting down, actually testing it, uh, going through the examples with me, hopefully a bit more of that will stick, because that was sort of one of the, the criticisms that they had was that, They'd spend two hours learning about something and then they'd walk out the door and it was gone. So hopefully we'll get you guys a bit more hands on, a bit more involved and we can, we can sort of work over that. Uh, how to work in project teams. So that's more specific for the people who are doing, uh, well actually I suppose if all you guys are here, hopefully you're all doing 603 at least. Um, so as part of 603 we have these projects. How to conduct original research comes into the thesis component. So there are several things which, again, Rob will go over, uh, which are required for a thesis, but one of them is original research. So you can't just do what someone else has done before. There has to be an aspect of originality to it. There has to be an aspect of um, like interest in it. You can't, like, it's much harder to, to defend a thesis if you can't say why it's important. You're like, oh, I've done, I did this thing, like we studied how you could get VR running on a uh, banking mainframe from the 1970s your examiners will be like, who cares? So, you know, being able to do something with a little bit of purpose um, and a little bit of novelty always sort of helps out. And again, as I said, hopefully we'll get you guys working with industry. We'll part you, partner you with some industry um, partners uh, so you can work with them and hopefully get paid for it, which is always good, and hopefully get jobs at the other end. 
if you're not planning on staying on for a PhD, which is, for me, was just an excuse to avoid getting a proper job <laughs> for a few more years, which is another valid career choice. So um, I say valid because here I am all these years later and sometimes feel like I haven't moved very far, but that's okay. So as far as the prototyping course goes, this is the rough sort of layout that it's gonna take. So we're gonna start with low fidelity prototyping. As I mentioned, a lot of this has been sort of shuffled over into Anthony's course now. So it's gonna be probably, it might feel like it's quite brief. We'll probably get through it in a couple of lectures. Um, but there are still some tools in there that, that he is not gonna talk about and some things. There will be an assignment on low fidelity prototyping. It is worth the, the minimum of the three assignments. Um, so don't stress if you don't feel like you've necessarily learned enough. It's really just to give you guys, well actually I, I guess the way I look at assignments is it's forcing you guys to actually do some work on your own. So you, you can all come, and I hope you do all come to the lectures and listen and absorb some stuff, but prototyping is one of these things, the only way you're ever gonna get good at it is to actually do it. And we'll do some of it in class, but you know, the more you guys can do in your own time, the better you'll get at it, and hopefully by me forcing you to do some assignments, you know, that will help with that. Um, so in Below Fidelity, we're gonna look at paper prototyping, which is probably the least unsexy term you could ever imagine in, your world, in the world, but you know, it has its strengths. Video prototyping, which is, will make you, unless you're a natural born show person, will probably make you very uncomfortable to do because it's basically like pretending you're like in a primary school play um, while someone films you, which is always fun. Um, and experience prototyping, which is kind of this weird thing that I, you know, some people defined and it kind of just encapsulated everything else, but added some new stuff. So um, you'll find all through, through the talks, I am not the most rigid person when it comes to like terms and definitions. We don't have an exam, so you don't need to worry about that. You're not gonna say, we're not gonna have a question, or we're not gonna have an exam, period. All right, so we're all gonna boil in here like lobsters. Um, we're not gonna have an exam and I'm never gonna ask you to define experience prototyping because I couldn't do that myself. It's more about having these tools, having these things that you can be like, oh, I cannot figure out how I'm gonna do this. What tools do I have in my tool belt that I can say, actually, if I do this, it might, might help me sort of understand the problem a little bit better. Um, then we're gonna move into software prototyping. So we're gonna look at two main uh, languages or development platforms, IDEs, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, processing, which is uh, based on Java originally, but it was sort of, it's been described as programming for artists, which is kind of good because artists generally aren't good programmers. So hopefully by encouraging, sorry Greg, can I get you to open these windows? Can I get you to open the windows? Thank you. Um, Cause as one thing we discovered in our new system to open the windows has the worst user interface of any piece of software ever developed. So. Um, yeah, so processing was developed by artists which, who are really good at doing art usually, but not really good at the engineering science side of things. So it's designed to be easy, you just start doing stuff. You don't have to worry about all this weird Java stuff, public static void main, in square brackets, args, and everything. Um, then we move into Unity, which is a commercial game development platform. Um, there's sort of two big ones at the moment, which is Unity and Unreal. Uh, there's also Cry, which um, Rob talked about before, but the, the two things, Unity tends to be more associated with, I guess, indie startups, amateur developers, stuff like that, for no reason other than the fact that, you know, it's quite simple to get started with. Uh, Unreal is more, well, is more closely associated with AAA games, so, you know, these big game development studios with, like, hundreds of thousands of, well, thousands of employees, rather, um, that's not to say that you can't make AAA games in Unity and you can't make indie games in Unreal. Um, I'm much more familiar with Unity. I use Unity probably 50, 60 hours a week, so I'm pretty comfortable with it. Um, so I will be uh, teaching you guys about that. And as part of that, we're gonna look at a couple of, couple of aspects, uh, graphics and multimedia input, all that sort of stuff. Then we'll move it to hardware prototyping, and this is where Niels comes in. So Niels, is, his background is he's an engineer. So hopefully he knows his stuff. Um, I used to teach it, I know enough about electronics to not electrocute myself and die, um, but he'll take this much better. And him and I, are, one thing we're trying to do this, this intake as well is really try and mesh all the assignments together. 
So hopefully, you know, you do some stuff in low fidelity prototyping that'll feed into the software, that'll feed into the hardware. So hopefully you'll get this nice sort of um, roundabout thing. And then at the end, uh, I always put this at the end because it's a little bit like um, boring. <laughs> For lack of a better thing, it's fabrication. It sounds like it should be really interesting, um, but 3D printing is dull as anything, especially with our 3D printers, which usually take three or four times before you get a proper print out of them. So you sit there and you hit print and you come back 40 minutes later to find that the, uh, the extruder stopped feeding and then you have to scrape it off with a spatula and flick it away, and then you print it again. And that's, that's about as exciting as 3D printing gets, to be honest. Um, so I'll put it at the end so that if we overrun, we can <laughs> We can cover that afterwards. There is no assignment for the fabrication part. So uh, it's really more, and it's, you know, fabrication, for the stuff we do, it does tend to be a lot of like uh, duct tape and string and wires hanging out and bits of software, which is sort of like really mashed together because we're not interested in, particularly for your master's thesis, in producing something that you can put on a shelf and sell. We're interested in proving a point. We wanna, we wanna do some studies, we wanna, prove that this can be done. We don't care if things are, are literally hanging together by string in the background, as long as it works. Fabrication is putting something into a nice package and making it look good for an end user. So that always sort of gets pushed to the back and if we have time, we'll deal with it. Um, so there are a couple of textbooks. So you'll notice in the middle, um, there is a big wad of books. So we have this first one, Programming Interactivity, which there is a copy for all of you guys to borrow, you don't get to keep them, you have to give them back at the end of the course because the next group will want them. And there is this interaction design book as well, which is probably actually again more related to the stuff that um, is now being taught by Anthony, but that's okay. So the programming interactivity book is, it's a bit old now, but you know, in the world of software, unless you're sticking at cutting edge things, don't tend to change very much because otherwise uh, people who work in software would very quickly find new careers. Um, so all the stuff in there is pretty much relevant today. Uh, so programming interactivity covers processing. It covers another language called Open Frameworks, which we don't use anymore because I used to teach it and after at my end of, uh, well, actually end of thesis sort of uh, summarization of, you know, did you find what we taught you in class is useful? Not a single person ever used Open Frameworks. Um, but a lot of people went on to use Unity, so I ditched Open Frameworks in favor of Unity. I don't actually have a Unity book, but there is just an absolutely obscene amount of material online. Yes? So work came out like um, Fiddler, was it renamed, uh, renamed? Like, was it C++? Yeah. I think yeah, I, I don't know if it was renamed, as, as long as I've known it's been yeah, called Open Frameworks. I think I was doing some audio visualization stuff with it sometimes, so it's probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, one, it's one of these things, Pro processing, I feel, they're both open source, which means, you know, they're for everyone to use and contribute to. Processing seemed to be a little bit more sort of managed though, like there was a team who were looking after it. Open frameworks felt a little bit more like everyone just sort of threw stuff out there and you'd spend, you know, the first week you'd sort of just trying to figure out how to make it work because no one was really maintaining it as a project. Um, There's a lot of cool stuff in there, but yeah, it, for what we are trying, we're trying to get you guys to be productive as fast as possible, because we only have like a limited amount of time before you start your thesis, and asking you guys to spend two weeks trying to figure out how to install open frameworks is not a productive use of your time. So, so we ditched that, but yeah, the, this book uh, goes, it has a really great sort of introduction primer to computer science, or programming rather, uh, which we will be going through, well not in the books, but we'll be going through an introduction to programming in class. Um, but it also, de so it deals with processing, or learn starting programming, processing, and it does a lot of stuff with Arduino and stuff, so it's also relevant for the stuff that Niels will teach later on. Uh, the design book is probably less relevant now that all that stuff's moved into 602. Okay, so that is a sort of a brief introduction. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself now. Uh, so I'm Adrian Clark. Um, so yeah, I did my PhD in computer science, Actually, if we go further back. So I grew up in Papua New Guinea. Uh, when we were over there, my dad bought a Commodore 64. Uh, I don't know why. For those of you, you guys are all probably too young to know what that is, but it was a computer which was about this big, uh, and you plugged it into your TV, and it had the built-in keyboard and everything. And I love that computer, um, but the you know this is in the days before internet or anything like that. Uh, I used to get the big five and a quarter inch floppy disks, 
And it turns out that Papua New Guinea being a third world country, it's quite difficult to get software. Um, but the cool thing about the Commodore 64 was it actually came with a programming manual. So I learned how to program when I was about eight years old because I was a really real geek and you know I had a computer and I had nothing to run on it. So I would read my programming book that came with it and wrote my first programs, which were awful. And then in high school, I started doing some more programming again, came to university, did computer science, did a PhD in computer science, working in conjunction with the lab. Um, as part of that, I, I developed this augmented reality coloring in book technology and spun out a company with some guys from the lab who were doing their PhDs and internships at the same time and we're still kicking around. And I've never really been able to properly leave the lab because I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, but yeah, so basically I've, so I've been here more or less, uh, I think the lab started in 2003 and I started here in about 2004, 2005. So I've been here quite a long time um, in one, way, one form or another. Uh, so part of the reason why I'm still here is because our old director, la uh, Mark, um, old lab director, Mark, uh, had been here since the start. He founded the lab. He was one of the sort of godfathers of augmented reality. Um, his, for his PhD, he developed, uh, in conjunction with Hiro Kato, uh, a toolkit called the AR Toolkit, uh, which was for the longest time the gold standard of AR. If you wanted to do something in AR, you built it on top of AR Toolkit. Mark did that over in Seattle, Washington, uh, under the HitLab US, which is now more or less sort of defunct. It still exists by name, but there's actually no physical building, no staff or anything. It's just this research lab. They have started up a new research lab there, which basically is the spirit of the HitLab, um, but it's got a different name that I can't remember anymore. Anyway, so Mark, yeah, was working under there under Tom Finesse, who is still considered an adjunct professor. Uh, he hasn't been here in a while, but he used to visit. He used to summer in um, Seattle, Washington, and then when it turned to winter, he'd come and work in New Zealand for six months. So he lived in perpetual summer, which is not a bad way to live. Um, and Mark was his PhD, PhD student. Mark came down here because he's originally from up north, uh, or up, uh, I think, Tauranga way, and moved to Christchurch because the university was wanting to set up a lab. He's, he founded the lab. He was my PhD supervisor. Um, and then I guess four or five years ago, he um, was constantly being gently sort of pushed out and not in a mean way. It is, a, it is one of these things that if you decide to stay as an academic for life, you are kind of expected to move from time to time because they don't want people getting stuck in their old ways and you know, just do the same thing day out and day, day in, day out forever because that doesn't foster creativity and imagination and all these things which good academics have, which is the same reason why we have sabbaticals and stuff like Christoph's on at the moment, basically to give him some time to get away from all his day-to-day -day monotonous work and actually spend some time just focusing on research, get passionate about being an academic again. So yeah, Mark uh, was, you know, constantly receiving, you know, why don't you go, you know, do a sabbatical or, uh, go somewhere else and then was offered a, an opportunity to go work in Australia. So he set up a lab over there called the Empathic Computing Lab, which is sort of his, after working in AR and human space technology, was kind of a, a sort of nice, um, a sort of a nice extension of that. So human interface technology is basically looking at how humans interact with technology. Empathic computing is looking at how humans work with humans through the medium of technology. So it's sort of, you know, we look at, there's a human here and there's a computer here. Empathic computing puts another person on the other side and you look at the, the relationships between humans as mediated by technology. And now he is working, he then got offered a, another job at Auckland University. So now he is like 60% of his time in Auckland and 40% of his time in Adelaide, which just sounds like a nightmare, um, working in two different places in two different countries. But yeah, so that's sort of a brief history of myself and the lab, which wasn't so brief, uh, and I apologize for that. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I have been programming my entire life. Uh, that's why I'm still here teaching this course, because as much as I'm sure they'd like to get rid of me for a number of other reasons, I'm quite good at this stuff, and I helped provide a sense of continuity as well. When Mark left, I knew how all the machines worked and how everything else worked. So what about you guys? So just, uh, I don't know how you guys best want to do, well, let's just go around. So I'm going to admit now, 
just get it straight off the bat, I'm terrible with names. Probably by the time you guys are about ready to graduate, I will know what your names are. Um, so do please apologize and forgive me for that. Uh, it's not being rude, I just, there are certain things I'm really good at, names, dates, and places are none of them. So do not tell me to meet this person at this place at this time, as I will not be there. Um, send it to me in an email. But yeah, let's go around and if everyone could just say your name and what, yes. If, any, if anyone's uncomfortable talking about it, we're more than happy to pause it. We do prefer that we, we do. It's all right, I'm not going to be asking you about your criminal history or anything like that. No, basically, all, I, all I'm interested to know is I really want these lectures to be more than just me sitting here for twice a week talking at you guys for two hours. I want this to be more collaborative, more involved. You know, you guys, if you have questions, if I haven't explained something, if there's something you want to know more about, just stick your hand up and ask. I'm never going to be annoyed or upset at you interrupting me. I'm never going to be annoyed or upset at you saying, I didn't understand that. Could you please tell me more about that, whatever. Um, I do have limits, you know, if you tell me that I'm doing an absolutely crappy job, then I'm, I might not be so happy, but, <laughs> but please do if you do have any feedback. But as part of that, I also want to try and tailor the courses to your guys' strengths and weaknesses. If you are all like 20 year plus veterans in the computer science industry, spending so much time programming is probably not a good use of your time or my time. Um, so yeah, I, you know, if you guys could just tell me a little bit about well, you, your name for starters so I can forget that like the second you mention it, but also if you could maybe talk about uh, any experience you've had with software or hardware or any of the things that I, I'll actually scroll back here, any of these things so that if you're all pros in something, you know, I know that we probably don't need to spend quite as much time on it, so. Uh, so my name is Abhishek Mahesha, I'm from India. Uh, I've, my background is in design, so I have a bachelor's in design. Mm -hmm. So I've worked for two years as a user experience designer. So I worked on experience design software and then various hard, local IT, IT research, I and then stuff like that. Uh, so that's about it. Cool. Now when you say low fidelity and high fidelity. Like the resource I can, the, the, for the app, so I design the app, mm -hmm. but I don't do the front end. Okay, part of it. cool, all right. So you can make something look really nice, but you need somebody else to make it do stuff. Okay, no, that's all good. It's good to see you because I think we met two years yeah, ago or something. Yeah, to talk about this. So. Yeah, I thought I'd scared him off, but here he is. <laughs> If I'm ever sick, you can just give the lectures for me then. That's all good. <laughs> Work very closely with the designers and the UX and UI designers, and uh, that's how I got interested in the field. I, 
I know nothing about designing. I know nothing about programming, but I hear the door. Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh, good. I might get I might get you to take that then. Um, yeah. Uh, anime uh, robots. I, I just finished them. Uh, my active plan uh, four years in China, right. and, uh, and then uh, one year I was on vacation in summer uh, in New Zealand. I just worried about programming. I'm teaching myself. Uh, I spent half the course to work hard. All right. Well, you'll be glad to know we don't use Python here. <laughs> We won't be using Swift either, so <laughs> so everything all you've learned is a waste of time. No, um, <laughs> no. So that, that's good. I mean, it's good that um, you know we've got obviously got a lot of varied backgrounds. Some people who have done some electronics, some people who have done some programming stuff like that. Um, as I said, my background is primarily in uh, programming, and you know I joke about oh we're not using that, so that's useless. Uh, it is. Uh, Programming languages, for those who have done nothing in it, are very much like spoken or read languages. So, you know, maybe particularly for people who English is not their first language, or actually I'm not so sure about Asian languages, but I know with European languages, if you can speak French, you can sort of pick up bits and pieces of Spanish and stuff, because they're all a bit interbred and intertwined. And it's very similar, again, with programming languages. So, uh, Python is not really like Java or C Sharp, which, what, which is what we're going to be using in these, but some of the stuff you do know will be transferable. You look at that and be like, oh, that's kind of like this. In the same way that Swift, Swift is kind of Apple's approach at doing a basic like language. Um, as someone who can't, who doesn't know Swift myself, I can look at a Swift example and I can translate it into something that I do know about 80% of it, even though I don't know it, because I can look at it and I can figure out what it's possibly trying to do. So the things that you have learned as far as programming goes, um, you know, they will be transferable. Maybe not directly, it's not like, um, you know, being able to speak English with a, you know, New Zealand accent and English with a British accent, but there'll at least be stuff that you can be like, I think I, I understand what's going on here. I, I think I can sort of grasp some of these, um, some of these things, and it's good for me as well because it means that it's not a complete waste of time for me teaching you guys um, how to program, uh, especially if like, you know, half of you are awesome programmers and half of you aren't. And it's like, I do often say, if, if there is anything, and you know, this carries through, but I think there will hopefully be something for all of you to learn in this course, uh, but if, I, I, if you're like, well, actually I know everything there is to know about Unity, um, come and talk to me, I'm more than happy to give you the slides, you can look through them and if you're like, I know all this stuff, you can have that day off when we talk about that, <laughs> that's fine. Cool, anyway, so let's get started into the, into the course. So we're going to start uh, with, I guess, a, an overview of prototyping to start with. Um, again, this is uh, me trying to distill a lot of people's different opinions into a bunch of slides. So there may be stuff which conflicts in here, there may be stuff that you don't agree with. Um, I'm more than happy to have a discussion, not an argument, about what you guys do and do, do and don't feel uh, counts as being a prototype and stuff like that. I'm not going to say that this is gospel. Uh, pretty much nothing in here, other than perhaps when we get to the 3D printing, because there's really only one way to 3D print something, and most of the time it won't work anyway. Um, you know, none of this is set in stone. You can, you can write a thousand different programs which do the same thing. Um, you can do a thousand different prototypes to explore the same thing and ideally, especially when we sort of, the sort of stuff we do in the HitLab, we encourage creativity. We don't want you guys to all give us exactly the same solution. And, um, you know, the, I think uh, Rob talked about the uh, group a couple of years ago who did projects for the Antarctic Centre 
the, that was, that's sort of our gold standard, what those guys did, because it was really creative, it was really out there, that we put them into two groups and their solutions to the problem could not have been more different if they tried. And that's exactly what we want. Um, it's the same thing, I've had various levels of success <laughs> with the assignments, particularly I try and with the first assignment, which is around low fidelity prototyping, try and give you guys the freedom to be really creative. Uh, however, I feel sometimes I haven't quite emphasized that enough. And so I end up with, you know, four or five assignments, which all have the exact same end solution, um, which is not a bad thing. Perhaps that is the best and kind of only solution, but it's way more exciting for me to see you guys like just come up with absolutely like insane stuff. And th this is the thing, like even the stuff which we were doing at the Hit Lab before we sort of got a bit more designing, a bit more creati creative, like when it was still engineering and science, it was stuff which we were trying to look forward 10, 20 years into the future. Uh, a lot of those predictions were wrong, but you know, you have to be quite creative to sort of think about that, to think, well, we don't actually have the, the computing power, we don't have the technology, we don't have the interfaces, we don't have X, Y, Z to do this, but what if we did? What would we be doing? How would we be using them? So yeah, I, I really wanna, all of this I really want you guys to sort of, you know, take out of it what you find is useful, don't worry about the things that you don't. Again, there's no exam, so you're not gonna be tested on a, a rote knowledge of all this. I want you guys to be creative and I want you guys to learn these tools to allow you to be creative in a way which communicates your ideas. So, with that in mind, what is a prototype? So, a prototype, and even the, the literally the first sentence on the first slide is arguable. A prototype is a physical form of an idea. Prototypes don't have to be physical. Um, so straight off the bat, we're getting off on the wrong foot. Um, but uh, when a lot of people talk about prototypes, they think of something physical. Uh, you wanna be able to articulate with a greater level of description and expression and idea. I've got something in my head and I'm really struggling to describe to you guys what it is because my language is failing me. I don't have a good enough vocabulary, I can't. I, I, this idea is only half formed. Um, I want to be able to, communi to communicate to you guys. Doing a pro building a prototype, designing a prototype is a really good way to communicate that. And we will, there's a, probably my, my favorite slide in this selection comes up in three or four slides, which talks about what prototypes are good for. And I think I probably need to move that earlier in, in the lecture slide because I think it really hammers home this idea. But really, you know, prototypes uh, allow us to articulate so we can basically show you, I can show you guys what I'm thinking of, what I'm trying to, what my idea looks like. I can show you parts, I can, I can see for myself what parts are there and what parts are missing because I haven't really thought about the missing parts until I try and build it. Um, and it allows you guys to experience and interact with them as well. So you can, you can look at this, you can pick it up, and you can be like, oh, but you know, this part isn't right or this part doesn't work or whatever. So it allows you guys, it's basically a way for me to transmit what's in my brain into your guys' brain in a way that hopefully you can understand it and you can start putting your input into it as well, more than me just trying to explain something and you guys not getting the, the picture because I'm really terrible at explaining or you're really terrible at understanding. Um, so prototypes can take the form of anything physical. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical, but a lot of the examples we'll be looking at. Uh, so post-it notes, so there's a, a ton of those. Some students have really latched on to this idea of post-it notes and uh, uh, Zoe's finished her master's, moved on now. She was sitting right down by Mel and she had her entire, like two windows by her desk just covered in post-it notes because she found that a really useful way for her to, to prototype, to mind map, you know, things which were in her mind, she could write it down, stick it on a board. Yeah, well, kind of slightly different from storyboarding. It was more mind mapping, so getting ideas and putting them out there so that she, because sometimes, you know, you think of something, you're like, oh, that's really great, I've got to write it down, and you forget about it, or it forces, because you've held on to this idea so tightly for so long because you don't want to forget about it, you sort of haven't allowed yourself the creativity and the freedom to explore around it. So being able to sometimes just write something down, and stick it on a wall, be like, I'll come back to that. It's, it's still there. Um, role playing. So a good example for role playing, um, there was one of the previous uh, groups of master students. Uh, for their, their project, they, um, there was, so there's a kind of a educational museum institute-y type thing in Christchurch. I don't know if they actually have a physical location at the moment because their old one was destroyed in the earthquake, but it's called Science Alive. 
And basically the idea was, <coughs> it used to be kind of like a, a museum techie thing that you'd go into primarily for kids and they'd have like statues of volcanoes and you could do stuff and you'd see the volcano erupt and physics demos and all that sort of stuff. Basically you get kids interested in science, engineering, all, all the sort of STEM stuff. Um, so their building got destroyed in the earthquake. Uh, we've all, they're, they're still around, um, but I think now they're doing more educational things for schools like toolkits. So a school can buy stuff and they'll put together like 50 things which teach electronics or whatever. Um, but we did a, a project with them. There was like a, as part of the, because obviously, for those of you who don't know, there was a massive earthquake in Christchurch like uh, eight years ago now and absolutely decimated like most of town. If you go on there, it's still an absolute wreck. Um, but as part of it, a lot of people left Christchurch because we had w two massive earthquakes and then about over a thousand like noticeable, like quite decent sized earthquakes. So a lot of people got really scared, understandably so, and left. And there's, it's still going on today that they're you know, trying to bring people back to Christchurch with all this. It, it's quite an exciting time. There's all these festivals and arts and crafts and all this sort of stuff to try and say, hey, yeah, you know, town is still in a pretty rough way, but there's still community here. You know, there's still people there's people who want to foster and in some ways it's it's really it obviously brought out a, a lot of really bad things but it's also brought out a lot of really good in the community people trying to bring this uh, shattered city back together um, so as part of that the science live was involved in something it was like they just blocked off entire streets in town basically and had all these different organizations doing stuff and so science live uh, they contacted us because we have this long-standing relationship with them and they want to do something using our now robot. Have you guys seen the now robots? Okay, you'll you see them at some point in time. I'll maybe get one out in the, we'll have a 10 minute or five minute break in 10 minutes. But they're, you know, bipedal robots. They're about this big. They're worth like 30 grand or something obscene. Um, constantly breaking. I don't think, well, I think we've got five. We've got five of them. Two of them are at the company being repaired and the other three are broken in some way, shape or form. <laughs> um, but they want to do something with that because they're really, they're really quite cool. Kids love them to pieces. Um, so they're like, we're doing this thing with kids. Uh, we want to, we want to use these robots, and we're like, okay, yeah, cool. We can do something about that. So their project was basically prototype a bunch of different engaging experiences that children can have with these robots. In, and you know, there was a set of constraints. It's a, it's an open thing. Uh, kids are going to be coming and going constantly, so you can't. It can't be like let's sit down and have an hour-long discussion with a robot. It's got got to be something that brings people over. It's got to entertain them for a couple of minutes. It's got to involve large groups. It's got to deal with children, and at the end of two minutes, they got to they got to feel like they've had a, a, a enriching, a rewarding experience, and then go away because there's plenty more kids who want to see it. Um, so they they spent a lot of time. You know, we we tried to be very clear. You know start low fidelity prototype and move up to higher fidelity and so on and so forth. Instead they went straight to programming the robots and programmed a bunch of things and um, spent of their four weeks, I think they spent about three of them programming all these different experiences with the robots. They did a bit of low fidelity prototyping like, oh what would be a cool thing to do with a robot? Oh you could have it um, arm wrestle for example and you know they've got little servos and stuff so you can pr apply a little bit of pressure. And they had some quite clever ideas. He had, they had like these foam things and when you went down, it pushed a little button, and then the robot's like, oh, you won. Um, whether or not you want a $30,000 robot arm wrestling with a child <laughs> who's probably going to break it is, is debatable. But they had a lot of things like, the robots can do speech recognition. And so you talk to them, well, they don't do it, I think they cloud services. So you talk to it, and it sends it off to Amazon, and Amazon says, the person said this, and then you can, so you, the robot goes, what's your name? And you go, Adrian, and it's like, hello, Adrian, blah, blah, blah. Um, they, so they started, went, did a few little load of Fidelity prototypes, but kind of jumped ahead and then started programming these robots. And the first time they actually dealt with children, they took these robots out uh, to, a, I think, maybe to that school, so there's a primary school just there. If you, haven't, if you do anything involving kids, we've got a school right there, which is quite handy. Uh, we have contacts at the hospital if you do anything around medical. Uh, we've, we've got contacts all over the place we can hook you up with. Um, but yeah, they took it to the school, uh, they spoke to the principal, and he's like, oh yeah, we, we'll get you a class of kids. Got a class of kids. Now, does anyone have a background in primary education? So my wife used to be a primary school teacher um, and eventually had enough of it and moved on. Um, but when you get 30 kids out of the classroom in an environment with some exciting technology, you can probably guess what's going to happen. It was basically an hour of children screaming at these robots, 30 at a time, and... 
Uh, as anyone, if any of you have ever used speech recognition before, it is terrible at the best of times, let alone with 30 kids screaming at it. So these guys have spent like three weeks worth of work, you know, building these quite cool interfaces that were never going to work because kids just cannot calmly speak to a robot so that a ro voice recognition... And then even worse, on the day, uh, because it was set up in the streets and stuff, they didn't have, you know, proper access to power and stuff, they were stuck by a big diesel generator. And so the whole time they had this machine going bum, 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 next to them. So in the end, I just said, look, you know, you guys spent, you guys sort of jumped ahead, spent way too much time on this. You're going to have to quickly, like, whip up some sort of prototype. So I think in the end, they, they modified the program so that they could have somebody sort of, and we'll talk about this later on, it's called Wizard of Ozing, but they had somebody sort of sitting there kind of disinterested on a laptop in the background, but every time the kid would say something, they'd quickly type it into the computer. <laughs> and then the robot would be like, oh, they're like, what's your name? And they'd be like, oh, it's Adrian. And then you're like, and then the robot would be like, hello, Adrian. And the kid's like, oh, it's so amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I said to this, I'm like, so what did you guys learn? Like, and this is why we do the projects. You know, they, they jumped their heads, they missed a few steps, and it, it bit them. And I was like, what did you guys learn? And they're like, we really should have actually done something before we started programming. And I was like, would role playing have been handy? Like, dress one of you guys up like a robot and pretend you're a robot and then go see... And they're like, yeah, that actually would have been really useful because I think even as a person trying to decipher 30 children screaming into coherent commands um, would have been quite difficult. So, you know, literally stick someone and get some PVC tubing and stick it over your arms and go, oh, I'm a ro <laughs> robot from a terrible 1970s sci-fi movie and see how that goes before you actually start writing a single line of code. Um, so things like role playing can be really useful. Physical spaces uh, are really useful if you're doing anything which is going to be based in the physical space. If you're designing an app, people are going to use it everywhere. It's quite difficult. If you're designing some sort of um, thing which relies on space movement, so uh, if you guys haven't seen yet in the vision space room, there's Rob's got these big cages that you can go in and experience these things. Stuff like that, you need to prototype in a space. You can't just sit at your desk and be like, ah, oh, that's fine, that'll, that'll be fine. I mean, for the, it was obviously very hard for them to predict this, but again, for these guys with the robots, had they known that the requirements of the space they were going to be in, that there was going to be a massive diesel generator next to them, they probably would have thought twice about using voice recognition. That one, I don't blame them for, that was just bad luck. Um, but it's the sort of thing. So we had a, we've had students who worked, uh, we had a, a student who did her master's three or four years ago, who ended up working on uh, working at the hospital on, um, it was part of a sort of an ongoing larger project, but it was around whether we could diagnose uh, people's um, likelihood of phobia to MRI. So has anyone ever had an MRI before? So I had one a couple of years ago because I had gallstones and it's a whole other story for another time. But it's, it's quite... Um, an uncomfortable experience. So there's, you know, the machine doesn't touch you or anything. Very loud, unbelievably loud. They they put headphones, like massive big deafening earphones, and you're still like, bum, 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 bum. but they slide you in there, and your nose is almost touching it. And it, it comes down to sort of about you, like I, I had to have mine over my chest because they were checking to see if there were still stones in my bile duct. And so I was basically from my head to my knees in a tube which was about that big for about 30 minutes. And, you know, I, I'm not claustrophobic or anything, so it was, it was still pretty awful, though, because there's, they put the, you have to wear these headphones, well, for me, because it was in my chest, and the, the CAT scan, or the MRI, they needed me to hold my breath whenever they took a picture. So I had these headphones in, and it'd be like, okay, and breathe in, and hold. Breathe out. Except one time it didn't actually tell me to breathe out, so I sat there holding my breath for, like, two minutes. Oh. And, yeah, it was just, it was just, generally a pretty unpleasant experience. So at the hospital, they have a few, a few of these MRI scanners, um, but the guy, our sort of contact, ongoing contact there, um, his particular interest is in pediatrics. So you get kids who are, you know, often quite sick, and you have to put them in these horrible machines for like up to an hour, where they're like boxed in, they're not allowed to move, and as you can understand, it's a pretty unpleasant experience for a kid. And the worst part about it is, as I said, like for my one, I had to hold my breath, usually for about 30 seconds where they took a scan, but one time it was like two minutes because the 
for some reason the audio didn't play and tell me to breathe out again, which is super uncomfortable. Um, but you know, for a little kid in particular, like we're talking ages five and under, that's a really traumatic experience. And the, the problem is as well, running an MRI, like you never turn an MRI off. Once it starts, it runs indefinitely until you decommission it. So it's always running, you, gotta, you get the magnets up to power and everything. Uh, and basically the operating cost for it, I think he said with the, all the stuff which is involved, the, the time, the power, everything, I may be wrong on this, but I have a feeling it was in the order of about $4,000 an hour. And what they do is because they, there's only a few of them, there's a, you know, these things take up a room, probably bigger than the room we're in, they're massive machines, and because they put out huge magnetic fields, the entire room has to be shielded so that it doesn't destroy other devices and stuff in the magnetic fields. Huge amount of space, hugely expensive to run. There's a limited supply of them. So the thing is, they book it out, you know, here's an hour, here's an hour, here's an hour, or half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. If you go in and you freak out and you panic, they pull you out, you go to the back of the queue. Uh, and in that time, you know, you're booked in for an hour slot, you get out, they can't bring the next person in because particularly if they're outpatients, you can't call them up and say, hey, someone just bailed, can you please drive in and have your scan now? So basically it sits there for $4,000, just doing nothing, nobody in it. So obviously this is a real problem for them. They, they wanna make use of this thing they have. So what um, this master student was doing was basically trying to use virtual reality to recreate as accurately as possible the MRI experience so that you could give test someone in their bed. So if they're an, an inpatient or even if they're an outpatient, have them lie down and recreate the experience and get them to go through it and measure their stress levels in the hopes that um, you know they will we can we can predict this person is likely to have a panic attack. We need to sedate them. Because often what they do with kids is uh, well at least historically, but our contact with the hospital has really been trying to work against us. You have a kid who needs a serious scan, anaesthetize them, put them to sleep, throw them in there. For a kid who's already really sick, anaesthetizing is quite a big deal. You know, some people have really bad reactions. They have to, and again, there's even additional cost to that. Like I got to visit and see uh, children who had been anaesthetized put into this thing. They had to have like three staff on just in case the kid had a bad reaction because they, need, you know, people will die from this. They, their heart stopped because their body can't handle it. So they had to have three staff just sitting there. They were just sitting there on their phones in the waiting room for the, the duration of the scan in case anything went wrong, they could rush in and you know, give the kid a shot of adrenaline into the heart to try and bring them back to life. So you know, the, the thing has always been kids are likely to freak out, put them to sleep, hope everything works out. But obviously they didn't want to do that, so they were trying, I think they, because of ethics and everything, they started on adults, but the end goal was if you can put a child in a VR simulation and predict whether this child is going to panic, you can basically hopefully halve the number of children who need to be anaesthetized before they go in. And that is a massive cost saving, that is being able to predict whether they need it or not is potentially a massive time saving in that, okay, this person definitely is gonna freak out, we, we can anaesthetize them. It is a massive, um, you know, health for people who are, who are sick, they can't be anaesthetized, or they're elderly, they're very ill, you know, it's a, quite a toll on the body. Like I had to, when I had my gallbladder out, I had to be put under general anesthetic. For about a week afterwards, I just felt awful. And that was the only thing which was wrong with me. If, you know, if you've got cancer or something seriously wrong with you, having that on top of everything else is quite awful. Um, so it was a really meaningful, like, this is, this is the, the dream sort of master's thesis of being able to define why this is important. Um, but she had a lot of constraints around physical space that I think, again, she probably uh, could have helped herself in the long run if she'd spent a bit more time sort of examining these things because uh, she had some issues with, um, obviously, MRIs, massive magnetic field, nothing electronic works in there. So she wanted to be able to measure people's anxiety uh, in the VR simulation versus in the actual MRI to tell, okay, this person, you know, you have galvanic skin response and stuff, you can tell how much people are, are producing certain sweat hormones and stuff. Um, you can do that easy in VR, because you can do that wherever you want. None of that works in an MRI. And so, you know, there was sort of a, a couple of weeks where she was frantically trying to find some way of measuring stress which was MRI friendly. 
So things like physical space, you know, that was something before she'd ever done anything. She could have gone in there and basically looked at, okay, what are the things that I want to measure? What are the things that I am able to measure in this physical space? So there, there are, you know, sort of restrictions around that as well. Um, physical objects, interfaces that could be user interfaces or other things, storyboards, um, as you mentioned before, which we'll go into a bit more later. And prototypes can have various levels of refinement as well. So usually the levels of refinement will reflect how far through the prototyping process you are. So you might start off with just a few like rough sketches. This is roughly what I'm thinking. And then as you go, you, you start fleshing those sketches out. You add more details. You maybe start prototyping various aspects of it. For the MRI example, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm thinking, you know, we could, to recreate the feeling of being in this MRI, we could, because there's various things, you know, it's not just enough to put on a head mount display because you have to wear the headphones. You've got this thing, because she was mainly focused on brain scans. You've got this thing which sort of sits on your face to keep your head still, which is quite uncomfortable. So you want to have, try and have as many of these elements in there to make it feel as much as possible. But you're not going to start straight away with that. You start looking at it, you go do a bunch of, um, sort of needs analysis or experience analysis to try and figure out exactly what's going on. And then from there, we're going to start, okay, well, can we use this? And she did do that. Um, you know, she looked at, with the, the thing, various uh, low, um, low cost things, like could you just stick a bucket on someone's head? Does that produce the same sort of experience as having one of these cages over your head, just getting, you know, go to the warehouse and buy a $5 bucket and throw it on someone's head with a VR headset. Um, so no, sort of, sort of tried to gradually work her way up. I think in the end, um, she was able to contact one of the manufacturers of the MRI machines, and they might have been able to actually send her one that she was able to cut up enough that you could fit on with the head-mounted display. So, but yeah, um, various levels of refinement. Don't assume it's a good idea to start at the end. Start at the beginning. It might seem like a waste of time, but at the very least, you know, you're, you're only adding on a little bit of time. Uh, and possibly discovering some pit, pitfalls, whereas uh, if you start at the end, you might discover something when you've already done 90% of the work that would have very easily been picked up very early on. All right, so let's take a break there, and we'll uh, come back in about five minutes and finish up these lectures. Be good, Greg? All right, cool. So, um, types of prototypes. So, low-fidelity prototype, well, basically it's a spectrum from low fidelity to higher fidelity. So low fidelity is really quick and dirty, um, stuff that you can easily access, cardboard, paper, whatever you have lying around, whiteboards, all that sort of stuff, getting, getting your idea out there as quickly as possible. There are advantages to doing that as well. The more time you spend building a pro prototype. And resources, minimum viable product. Well, even sort of beyond that, like the minimal viable product tend to be more towards the prototyping, higher fidelity stage. What we're talking about at this point in time is just investing in a, a sing, or not even investing, like put it presenting a single idea. With a higher fidelity prototype, so I write, I design a user interface for you guys, it takes me a week. You tell me you don't like it, I'm like, well that was a waste of time. I draw a user interface on the whiteboard, it takes me 30 seconds, you're like, I don't like it. I'm like, okay, well what else do you want to try? And there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of sort of psychological phenomenon about how attached we get to things based on how long we spend with them. Um, so, you know, we always want to start at the low fidelity because we want to get, ideally we want to get all the ideas out there as fast as we can. We want to brainstorm. There is entire schools of thought around this, but, you know, I'm a subscriber into the thing of get as much out there as you can, even if it seems like a terrible idea. In the, the very starting, very low fidelity stages, you never want to say no. You never want to say that's a bad idea. You never want to say that's not possible. Yeah, maybe it's not, but maybe you come up with an idea and you're like, oh, imagine if we had a flying car. I'm like, oh, that's a dumb idea, we don't have flying cars. And you're like, okay, well, scrap that. But maybe you go, we had a flying car. I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, let's put that in there. And then someone else says, what about a drone? Okay, all of a sudden, you know, by not throwing out that idea because it's not possible, someone else has actually bounced off that idea and actually come up with something which is possible. We do have drones, you can buy them for like 100 bucks these days. Um, so, you know, you want to, early on you want to just try and brainstorm, get as much information out there as possible. Don't, don't worry about what's possible, what's good, whatever. Get everything out there and then you go through this refinement process that um, I know Anthony's going to talk more. This, you have these brainstorming and refinement and you sort of go on this path where you 
you come up with as many ideas as you can, and then you whittle down some of the bad ones, some of the impractical ones, whatever. And you take the ideas that you have, and then you brainstorm around them. And so each time you're sort of growing the amount of ideas, and then you refine it down to things which are going to work. Um, so yeah, spectrum. We've got things like paper prototyping, video prototyping, uh, all the way Wizard of Oz prototyping, which we'll talk about is can be sort of anywhere along these. And in fact. Don't take these as gospel where they are. These can shift along depending on how much, really how much time you spend on them. But the idea is you want to sort of start low fidelity and gradually get higher and higher fidelity as you start honing in on your solution. Okay, so this is a slide that I was talking about that's probably my favorite slide of this entire um, set of slides today. Why prototype? So, you know, we often think we want a prototype, and I, I've talked about a few of these, but we want a prototype because we want to show someone what we're doing. But there's actually a whole bunch of other reasons, and some of the, depending on what point you are in the prototyping process, these have different value. So one which a lot of people don't uh, sort of overlook is empathy gaining. So um, actually, I'm going to come back to the slide. I'm going to explain each one one by one. So empathy, empathy gaining is basically trying to understand. We, if, if you're somebody coming into a thing, so you're doing a medical research thing, as far as I'm aware here, nobody holds a medical degree. Nobody's a doctor. Nobody has worked in this. Some of you may have been patients, um, so you may have some experience of what it's being like on the other thing. But if you're going in as, look at me, I'm a, I'm a, a human and face technologist. Oh, you're doing this all wrong. This is stupid and do this and that. You don't have the same level of understanding as the people who actually use this stuff 40 hours a week or the people who are really sick and in the bed and have to be hooked up to these machines. You know, you, you can go in there and you can prototype the best engineering solution or the best user interface solution, but if you're not thinking about how the users experience it, how they feel about it, you're not really doing your job as somebody who's creating a good user experience. So this um, picture here was uh, from some engineers who are building a new uh, bio-monitor um, sort of thing. So basically, basically measuring somebody who's, who's in the ICU or whatever they want to measure uh, oxygen levels in their blood, their heart rate, their pulse, uh, you know, all these various things. They have, you have dozens of sensors strapped to you. And from an engineering standpoint, okay, you've got to worry about things like making sure that um, the, the sen you've got the best sensors to measure these things. You've got things like signal reflection. So wires can only be a certain length, otherwise the signal starts to degrade. degrade. Lots of engineering problems to solve as well. Um, but this was, I'm not sure whether this was a pre or post prototype. But they, there was a system, when, what I mean by that, I'm not sure if this was what was currently being used in hospitals or whether this was their design. But looking at this, you can see this looks like a pretty uncomfortable thing. So you're already sick. You're lying in a hospital bed in a, a gown which is very loose fitting. You're constantly trying not to expose yourself. It's, it's just really unpleasant. And then for somebody to throw a, a box in your lap with a bunch of wires and hook them up to you, it's pretty dehumanizing for when you're already feeling pretty low. You know, you're, you're in hospital, you're quite sick, and you're being treated like a bench to hold some electronics equipment. By doing this, you know, this is, this is one of the engineers here. They got her, you know, obviously not fully, but dressed up enough. They put her in a gown and stuff. So she's already starting to feel some empathy for the people who are going to be constantly exposed to this, this environment. She doesn't look like she's really having a good time. Um, <laughs> Which is kind of exactly what the purpose of this is. If you're building something for people who are going to be sick and hooking up to them, you probably don't want to make them any more uncomfortable and any more unhappy than they already are. Simple solution for this would be to design it so that it sits under the bed and all the sensors hook along the side so that you don't, even things like reaching over. Um, a lot of, like I've got friends who work in nursing and stuff, and they will do things like, if I'm on this side of you and I need to get something there, I'll walk around you. I won't reach over you because it's quite dehumanizing. You know, you feel, you feel like you're not really being treated by a person because it's quite rude to lean over someone. So just little things like that can make quite a big difference. And it's not an engineering problem, you know. We're not like, oh, we need to get faster throughput. Oh, we need to worry about this. It's just looking at something and saying, what are the people who are dealing with this actually experiencing? Um, so why is it useful? Interviews and observations may not paint the whole picture. So you might go and uh, interview someone, say, tell me about your requirements for this new um, vital sign monitor. And they can tell you, oh, we need to measure this in X, Y, Z, and blah, blah, blah. 
uh, we need to make sure that the cords are long enough that we can deal with children as well as adults. And what. But they're probably not going to say we want to make sure that the, well, they, they might, um, but they may not say we want to make sure that the, the patient is comfortable. We want to make sure that it's not dehumanizing to them. It doesn't make them feel like they're just a, a broken piece of machinery that we're currently trying to fix. Um, and even, even observations, if you're observing something and they're doing it the right way, so you know, they're making sure to not lean over that, as somebody who particularly is coming into this field, it's not something you're likely to notice. You, you, unless you know why a nurse walks around the bottom of the bed, you're not thinking, oh, she could have just reached over and grabbed that, but she's not because it's quite dehumanizing. Um, walking a mile in the user's shoes, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. If, if someone's, you're coming in, particularly if you're contracted to do a project, you're coming in for, um, you know, maybe 10 weeks to build something, and then you, you hand it to them in a box and you say, all right, enjoy that. They have to work with that 40 hours a week for the rest of their lives, or the rest of their careers. You know, it's, it's not fair for, for you to build something really awful to use, or even, even small things, 40 hours a week for 20 years, a small problem becomes quite a large problem. So being able to sort of put yourself in their shoes and understand what it is like for the user to be doing these things is quite important. And it builds this idea of active empathy as well. You're, you're no longer just somebody who's looking at something from the outside and being like, oh, well, we can save 50 cents on electronic components if we, if we put this on top rather than on bottom. You're like, actually, I wouldn't want that. You know, you, you put yourself in this position and all your decisions start sort of getting shaped by that as well. It's no longer down to dollars and cents, it's down to how would I feel if this was me. Um, so why prototypes? So that's empathy gaining. Uh, exploration is, um, you know, one of the probably, I guess, one of the more obvious uses of prototyping. Be built to think. It's really easy, and I've done this numerous times in my life, to think, oh yeah, I've got a solution for that. And you start building it out, and like five minutes later, you realize that it's actually not going to work. Um, anyone who's done any DIY in their home will be like, that'll easily fit in there, and then all of a sudden you realize that it won't. You know, you've, you've cut the, the piece of plywood to perfectly fit the hole in the wall, but you can't actually fit it through the door of your house. So, you know, I've just done some renos on my house, not recently, uh, just recently, and made, continued making mistakes. I'm a programmer and I'm not a builder. Um, so, so, yeah, solutions mainly present themselves when you have all the pieces in front of you. So, actually getting, build, building a prototype can really help illustrate what you know, what you think you know, and what you don't know. Um, and people like, I'm a very visual person, so I like to draw stuff out, I, I like to write stuff down. If you, well, it's pretty clean now, but it's, come back to my desk in two weeks and there'll be like a thousand pieces of paper with various sketches of stuff on it as I've been trying to understand stuff and figure it out. But probably a slightly more, ex better example, has anyone seen the movie Apollo 13? Okay, so mo most of you, well, some of you more or less, so there's a, a famous part, it's obviously based on a true story, but there's this famous part where they had something broke and they didn't have the parts to fix it and so they had to design a new thing. And it was literally, they were trying to connect, um, they had this round hole and the square object that they needed to somehow get to connect to it in order for it to work. And there's like a famous saying, square peg in a round hole means that two things just won't work together. But that was literally what they were dealing with. And this is from this website which talks about it. We would have died of exhaust from our own lungs if mission control hadn't come up with a marvelous fix. The trouble was the square lithium hydroxide canisters from the uh, command module would not fit in the round openings in the lunar, mon lunar module environmental system. After a day and a half in the lunar module, a warning light showed, up, uh, showed us that the carbon dioxide had built up to a dangerous level, but the ground was ready. They thought of, thought, had thought up of a way to attach a CM, where are we, CM canister to the LM system by using plastic bags, cardboard, and tape, all materials we have on had on board. Jack and I put it together, just like building a model airplane. The contraption wasn't very handsome, but it worked. It was a great improvisation and a fine example of cooperation between the ground space. So what NASA tends to do is when they, they launch something to the moon or launch it to space, they will build two, one which goes in space and one which stays on Earth. So that it, And everything which goes in one goes in the other so that if anything goes wrong, they can jump into the other one and actually start putting stuff together and figuring it out. And in this case, like, I should see if I can find a clip of that. 
but they basically do. They go into the lunar module, they grab everything out of it they can, they throw it on the floor and start trying to figure out a way to make the square box fit in the round hole, which would be really difficult if you're just sitting in front of a whiteboard saying, oh, you know, we could do this, we could do this. Actually building these physical prototypes with the stuff that they had on hand, um, you know, w allowed them to basically save these guys' life. You know, there was, I think, three astronauts on board and they would have suffocated to death. Um, but because the, the smart people at NASA ha had basically put this into plan, they were able to prototype out a solution which worked for everyone. Um, so decision making, solving disagreements. So this is sort of almost a, uh, in some ways sort of feeds in from the exploration. So during design it's often unclear how to proceed forward, particularly when you're working in groups, you know. And this is, this is again, comes back to what I was talking about before about investment in designs. It's really hard to not, if you think you have a good idea, to not get invested in it. And you're like, my idea is the right idea. I know it, I feel it. And then someone else is like, I've got an idea. And you're like, well, I don't care because my idea is the right one. But of course, they're thinking the exact same thing. And prototyping can be a really good way of, um, you know, being able to decide which idea to proceed with. Uh, so you can articulate your thoughts, so you can try and use prototyping to explain why your idea is absolutely the best idea. Uh, and then you build it and you realize that it's actually terrible um, because it doesn't work at all. And the other person builds theirs and then you're like, okay, yeah, I, I concede, you're absolutely right. Or you get that awesome feeling of victory when you can be like, told you my idea was the best idea. But oftentimes um, with decision making as well, you sort of think that this is how it's going to be. So you have, the, some, you have some idea, you're trying to find an optimal solution for a problem. You have some idea and it's, it's close, but it's not quite perfect. And so you iterate that idea and eventually you end up with the optimal solution. Awesome, we have found the perfect solution for this problem. When in reality it's often much more like this. So you, by iterating over a bad idea, you actually just reach the peak of a non, the non-optimal solution. So these are all possible solutions for this problem. I know this is a weird way of, of illustrating it, but you know, these, the higher you get basically, the better the solution fits the idea. And there's a few other different bits and pieces. But if we'd have just picked our first idea and just run with it, you know, we do run the risk of solving the problem, but not in the best way possible. And this is also one of the reasons why working in groups and brainstorming is really good, because I might start here, someone else might start here, someone else might start here, and only by sort of prototyping through a few of these things at a very rough early stage are we likely to sort of say, okay, well it actually looks like your idea is probably gonna give us the best result. Oh, I've skipped it, no, no, we're still here. So how do we prototype for it? Stay as low resolution as possible. Don't waste time trying to eliminate solutions. You know, if if we all do low fidelity prototypes, it might be that at the end of it, we still have two. You know, we started with five, we still have two. That's fine. Then we can move on and try to refine these two solutions and see if we can eliminate one of them. But don't start with high fidelity on all of them because you might find a couple of them are very easy. You know, again, you try and do renovations on your house and all it took was measuring the size of the door frame to realize there was no way you were gonna get that kitchen bench in there. Um, Developing models of potential candidates distilled down to the most important variable. So what that basically means is we're trying to, if, we're, if we've got a bunch of things, try and figure out where they differ and try and prototype around that difference. Um, you know, we, it, it is possible, but less likely if we're working on quite a constrained problem that we will have massively different ideas. Normally it might be what, like, I'm like, well, I think it'd be really good if we, you know, put the, the thing on the underside of the bed and someone else is like, well, I actually think it would be better if it hung on the wall behind the patient's head because that way people from both sides can access or whatever. So you look at, in that case, the variable we're looking at is the positioning of the object. And so we can look at what other variables are there or rather what other, what other options are there for this. Is the, are these two the best two in that thing? Then let's prototype around that. Let, let's not worry about anything else. Let's just look at, okay, if we have it under the bed, versus on the wall, what, how does that affect things? And get feedback from your team or even a fresh set of eyes or even users. So one thing I really liked, again, about that Science Live project is the students in their one week project, the one week project is usually more of sort of a, a low fidelity design exercise. So you basically, you're given your topic, you go out, you try and get as much information as possible, you prototype to 
get empathy and all this sort of stuff. And at the end of it, you come up with a few very low fidelity prototypes and designs around it. And what we did with the Antarctic one is we actually had the people from the Antarctic Center come in and the students pitched their ideas. And I, th I think at that point in time, the students each had a separate idea, individual idea that they pitched and then the Antarctic Center picked the best two. And they gave their feedback, they gave their feedback on all of them, but they pitched the best two. And then for the next one, they were put into two groups and basically said, you can pick one or the other to work on. Unfortunately, they picked the different ones so that we got two completely separate prototypes. It made it harder to mark, but you know, it meant we got a better result in the end. Um, but you know, having the Antarctic people come in, they could see what we were thinking. They, they were like, oh, that's really good, but. And you know, all these considerations, things we didn't know about, things we didn't understand, you know, they're like, that's really great, but we have a lot of international visitors who don't speak English. The fact that all of these instructions are in English isn't working and that not so, you know, the, the students were looking for uh, design examples and hadn't even considered the ethnicity or the language requirements for people who are coming in. Um, where are we? Really need to put this in everything. Inspiration, help others catch your vision. Uh, again, this can come to an extent around, uh, you know, I think my idea is best and here's why. It's one thing for me to explain it, but if I build it for you to test, um, you might appreciate that a lot more. And also to the other thing, articulating it in, in detail can help others fully understand why it's difficult. This is something as a programmer, you, if, if well actually probably anything technical, any, any software, hardware, anything you build, people who don't know about it will say, oh, you can just whip that website up for me in a day, right? So, oh yeah, what would you like? Oh yeah, I basically want it to be Facebook. Okay, cool, yeah, that, that will only take me a day to do. But they don't understand, you know, it's like, what, what's so hard about it? So being able to actually, I mean, you know, websites are hard because there's a lot of back-end stuff which is really hard to sort of prototype out. It's really easy to prototype what it looks like on the front, but what's going on in the back is quite hard. Um, but, you know, it's that same sort of idea, particularly with stakeholders. And, you know, there is a certain amount of, uh, it is our job as designers, as uh, engineers, as developers, to manage expectations. Um, and as part of that, we want to make our lives easier. We want our clients to know exactly how hard this is going to be. Because if they, th if they come along, we're like, yep, no, that's great, that's awesome, no problems. And then we under-deliver because actually it was really friggin' hard and we just did a terrible job explaining that to them. They're gonna be disappointed and they're gonna think we're crap. But in reality, the problem was we didn't manage expectations. So being able to prototype with the user and sort of say, okay, here are the things which are gonna be hard, here are the things we need to know. Um, even getting them involved is even a perfect way. You know, Someone comes in, they want you to build well, they're like, oh, we want you to redesign our website. And you're like, okay, do you have any ideas? And very quickly, you'll find that nobody has any ideas. They just, they just want stuff done. And it's like, okay, well, what if we do, do you like, do you, have you seen anything you like? Could you go out and get me a bunch of, you know, bunch of images of websites that you like? And then we can work through these together and we can try and distill out what the, and I know that this is a topic that, um, Anthony's planning on talking about getting a whole bunch of examples of things that you like and trying to distill out what it is that I like about these things so that we can use that as a template to build. Doing something like that with the user rather than you doing it yourself can help explain and make it clear to them why this is a hard job. Uh, different perspectives of the same idea will uncover different paths. If I show you my idea and I build a physical or some sort of prototype to show you it, the, because of, you know, we've all had very different upbringings, we've all had different educations, we've all had different life experiences, we all see things in a very different way. And I might be like, this is what I've thought, and someone else might immediately look at it, someone with a background in industrial design, for example, might look at that and say, that's never gonna work. That thing is gonna break five seconds after you give it to someone because, you know, this part is too thin, you know, structural integrity, et cetera, et cetera. I have no background in industrial design. For me, that looks fine. Um, but you know, it's all these, th and I'm sure we've all had experiences where you use something and it breaks almost immediately and you're like, what were they thinking? Somebody, you can guarantee along, somewhere along the lines thought that was a great idea and had no background in any sort of, um, exper or no experience in being able to say, actually that thing's gonna break the second, you know, yes, it's really strong when you twist it this way, but it's not strong when you twist it that way. 
So being able to get uh, different experiences from people uh, really can help um, uncover issues and different things that you need to explore. And it can spark a chain reaction as well. Um, with my company, we, get, we do a lot of uh, client sort of outsourcing work and oftentimes we, we have clients who come to us and have no idea. They're like, you guys, the experts, you do it. And it's like, could you at least tell us where you'd like us to start? And oftentimes those are really difficult things. Well, so you sort of sit around and everyone's just a bit like, oh God, and what are we supposed to do? Like, they've given us nothing to work. And one person will have an idea and they'll be like, what about this? And all of a sudden, the mood of the room changes immediately. Everyone's like, oh yes, and we could change this and change that. And so having that chain reaction can actually be really good as far as creativity goes. Someone just needs to have the first initial spark but everyone else go, oh yeah, yeah, and what about this and that? So if you have an idea, you know, put it out there as early as you can. You know, don't worry about trying to refine it. Get it out there for other people to think about. Um, and if you're on the receiving end of an idea, never be critical until you're like miles down that path. If it's sort of the initial brainstorming, don't ever tell someone they've got it, had a bad idea because they will shut up and they will never give you another idea. <coughs> and finally with testing. So again, this is probably what most people think about when you're thinking about prototyping. You're building something to test whether it's going to work or not. Um, so we want to, we have an idea we want to articulate. Uh, we want to convey our ideas, test the approach, and refine the solution. We, I, I, I think this is going to work. I want to build it, see if it actually does work or not. Uh, we can test it as far as getting feedback from our user as well. We build something, we show it to our user, and we say, this is what we're thinking. What do you like? What do you, what do you think about it? And that, you know, it doesn't have to be a physical design. The students who did the Antarctic Center tested their prototypes, which were literally just drawing sketches and stuff like that. They hadn't actually done a single physical thing. They'd just drawn it and put together a PowerPoint presentation and spoke about it. But they still got a lot of feedback about that. This is going to work. You need to think about that, X, Y, Z. Um, and probing different aspects of the design solution. So how, how do we test? Well, ideally, if we can place, the context, place prototypes into the context of you, use. So prototype is if you know you're right, test is if you know you're wrong. So when you're building a prototype, you know, assume that it's the best prototype ever put. Make it, make it enough to test what you're trying to test at that point in time. But when you test it, assume that everything is going to go wrong. Um, again, with the MRI example, if you want to measure someone's... Um, you know, galvanic skin response to uh, test for how much they're sweating as it's an indicator of sweat, uh, indicator of stress, sorry. Build the prototype and then test it, put it into the context of use for starters, put it in there. But, you know, assume that there's probably going to be something that I haven't thought about here. And in this case, it was the fact that MRIs don't work with traditional galvanic skin responses and the entire solution needed to be swapped over to fiber optic in the end because light is in effect by magnetic fields. Why test? Refine prototypes and solutions. Testing informs the next iteration. So we put an idea out, or we, first we brainstorm, we refine, we get some ideas, we might choose to prototype them, we test them, and we see what happened. Was this good? Was this bad? What do we need to work on for our next prototype? Learn more about the user comes back to empathy again. So we test this, and uh, we might think, we've, we've sat down, I've spent hours talking to you I've come and I've seen you work in your place. I know exactly what the solution is. I present it to you and you're like, yeah, it's not going to work. Okay, can you please tell me why that's not going to work? Because obviously there is something that I'm missing here. And it can be quite frustrating, but at the same time, people, a lot, most people don't know how to explain what they need. They might not know what's possible. They might not uh, realize that there's a better way of doing something. They might be so bogged down in bureaucracy and red tape that this is the way that it's always been done. This is the way it has to, be done, has to have been done. So by presenting something to someone, they might say, we, we can't use this. You know, everything has to go via the manager first and she has, to decide, she has to say, yes, this is fine. No, it's not. Your system doesn't allow us to do that. Okay, that's not something you told me before, but now that I know that, I can go back and refine my prototype so it allows you to send it to your supervisor and she gets final say on it before we go ahead. Um, refine our point of view. Perhaps we only did the solution, perhaps not only did we not get the solution right, but we failed to find the problem. And that can be the same thing as well. Um, so we, we, we taught a, and this is a perfect example when one of these things goes horribly wrong. Um, 
We did a design thinking course, a uh, summer course a few years back, uh, which was the first time we ever did it, which a lot of the material is quite similar to what we cover in design and prototyping. It's sort of the entire thing, but condensed down even more than what we can listen at the moment. Um, and we got industry partners in and we paired people up with stuff. Some of, the, some of the things were really interesting, some of them were a bit boring. Uh, one guy really unfortunately got stuck with, um, I can't remember what they were now, but there was some community group, some community action group, you know, maybe uh, they were uh, planting trees up in the hills or picking up trash somewhere, doing something, they're a community group anyway. Uh, or it might have even been like a, you know, a theatre production group, you know, people get together and they put on theatre theater performances. But they were finding that they were having real issues uh, attracting new people. Um, and so the student came in and he spent a lot of time poring over the entire organisational structure. Well, they, they, no, sorry, they came in and they said, we need a new website. We're not getting as much involvement as we would like. We have sort of rings. We have the core management team who do 99.9% .9 of everything. We have sort of the, the committee around them who do the remaining 1%. And then we have a ton of people who have accounts on our website, never do anything, never post in the forums, never email anything, never do anything. We need a new website because obviously the issue is that people are having trouble using the website. And he spent a long time, he was like, uh, I'm not sure about that. The website's not great, but it's perfectly functional. And it's been a long time like going to these meetings, uh, pouring through all this documentation, everything. And he came back to them and he said, your structure is completely messed up. The reason that the core people are doing 99% of the work is because they are complete control freaks and they won't let anyone else do anything. Um, the 0.1% they delegate out is basically a, a token of, uh, we should probably let the committee do something. Okay, they can choose the new font for the newsletter. We're gonna do everything else. And the committee people were already there because they were really passionate about the thing themselves. And then everyone else was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested. I, I like nature, I like walking in the hills. I'm interested in this native planting. I, I don't, I'm using this specifically because I'm pretty sure that's not what it was. Um, so don't think that I'm, I'm talking bad about those people. I'm specifically using it because I'm pretty sure it wasn't this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, they, they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I like walking the hills. I like uh, nature and stuff. I'd be quite interested in doing some native planting up on the hills. And very quickly got turned off because there was like three or four people at the core of the thing who were just control freaks and everything had to be done their way. They were not open to any criticism. You couldn't say, oh, what if we did this? What if we, did? no, we do things this way. Unfortunately, the student was working directly for those people and in the end designed them a new website because that's all they wanted. And I can almost guarantee you, if you went back and talked to them now, they are still having exactly the same problem. So in his case, he really hit this thing. Well, actually, no, it wasn't him who hit it. It was his client. Had this thing that they had failed to frame the problem. He tried to get them to reframe the problem to what the problem actually was. You guys need to figure out your organizational structure because currently it is not working. And could, unfortunately for him, could not convince them. That was not his fault. He did everything he could and ended up just giving them what they wanted and did not actually solve the problem. But as, you know, in that case, you can't blame, blame that guy. But uh, as, you know, people solve, coming in solving these problems, we have to make sure that we're not doing the same thing. We're not coming in and saying, oh, the reason people aren't engaging is because your website's really hard to use when in reality it's actually because the people at the top of the chain are um, making everyone else's lives miserable. So how do we prototype for testing? Uh, quick low resolution prototypes again. Um, again, you know, there's a fair amount of repetition in these slides and I tend to get massively sidetracked at points in time and talk over it uh, beforehand. But as I've mentioned, uh, low resolution prototypes allow us to pursue ideas without getting attached. I'm not spending ages working on something only for the client or whatever to tell me, no, that's not what we want. And you're like, well, stuff you then, you know, oh, this, this is what I'm invested in. Um, low resolution to prototypes are also are likely to more, elicit more detailed feedback for the same uh, reason. If I show you a sketch of a bad idea, you're more likely to tell me that it's a bad idea than if I show you this beautifully designed, 
everything looks amazing, but it's still a bad idea because you can immediately tell that I've spent a lot of time and a lot of work on this. And as generally nice people, you know, we don't want to hurt people's feelings and be like, I really appreciate you spent a lot of time on that, but it's a bad idea. So by forcing ourselves to stick as low fidelity as long as possible, we're not going to get to attached to it. And also the people we're talking to are more likely to tell us from the start this is a bad idea, which is very important. We want to try and get all these problems out as early as possible. For the same reason we're doing these, these courses now for your thesis, we're trying to get all the problems out of the way so that you guys can um, come up with the best result at the end of it. Uh, bring resolution to the aspects which are important for what we are trying to test. If you are looking at some element of a UI design, you know, I, I will often come back to things like uh, user interface designs because it's what I'm familiar with. Um, but, you know, if, if you guys don't understand, please let me know and I will try to come up with a different idea. But say you're, you're designing your website, and this is a hard one for me because I'm not a designy person and I hate web, des web development. But say you're designing a new thing and someone wants a way uh, to navigate through the site. So various sites have looked at things like breadcrumbs. So as I click through, it'll be like home, um, accounts, personal information, right? And you see this little, they call them breadcrumbs, like across the top. So I can click and I can go back to any point in the chain I was at. If you're looking to test that, don't bother making the rest of the website look beautiful. Just, you know, draw boxes. Here's an image. Here's a title. Here's an image. Really focus on making sure that that breadcrumb shows what you want it to show because otherwise people will focus on the wrong thing. And this is something that in my company we are constantly having issues with. We'll send a client something and they'll be like, we're like, here is a rough idea of the user experience. Can you give us some feedback? Oh, we don't like how the button looks. Okay, the button is literally just a white square because we want you to focus on the experience. Of course you don't like how the button looks. We haven't done the button yet. We just want to get, and so trying to, you know, bring resolution to what you want people to focus on is important, but sometimes it's quite hard because people will focus on things that they shouldn't be focusing on. Test in the context. Um, again, if you're building something which works in an MRI, test it in an MRI. Um, and consider variables. So what things uh, are likely to change, what can you change, what can't be changed, and test accordingly. Uh, so in, in addition, when you're testing, check, make sure you're doing it in the right context and scenario, so the MRI thing. Um, use intentional roles. So if you are testing, you don't want to say to the person, okay, now click on that and click on that and then do this and that and that. Because effectively, you're not, that's not how users are going to use it. You know, you're, you're designing something for people to use. You're not going to be sitting there for the rest of your career going, no, don't click on that, don't click on that. You want to introduce them to the system, tell them only as much as they need to know, and then let them have at it. If they, if you are designing a user interface, a website or something, and people are clicking on things they shouldn't be clicking on, it is not your job to say, don't click on that. It is your job to say, why are they clicking on that? And what have I done that makes them think that they can click on that? Or that that is the right place to be clicking on? Um, you know, you are, as the designer, you are always wrong. <laughs> And you should always go into it looking at that. If somebody's doing something that you didn't expect, you have to ask yourself, why are they doing that? And how can I make it more clear that that is not how it should be? Or perhaps I'm wrong and that is how it should be and I need to go back and reevaluate that. So you're, you act as the host. You're going to transition. You're going to give them just enough information that they can get started. And then you're just going to shut up and watch. Uh, your players, um, if you have something which involves multiple people, so you're doing the MRI or you're doing the, the thing with the sensors, maybe you get some people to stand in as nurses and they and you know the person is acting as the doctor and you get some people on your team to be nurses and you say, okay, um, doctor, what would you like us to do? So they're the players. Again, they are not there to be like, we're doing this, we're doing that. They're just there to help out and try and fill those roles. So the person you are testing on at the moment, the, the doctor or whoever, is, you know, acting in a realistic environment. And then observers. I cannot emphasize this enough. When you are doing a user study, record everything all the time, nonstop, record it, store it. If there is any information, data, anything that can be recorded, record it. You can always delete it later. 
But if somebody, if something happens which is out of the ordinary, if somebody says something which is a really good point, you don't record it, that information is gone. You know, you can never recreate these user studies. You can never get the person in the same context of mind into which they said that. You'll ask them, what did you say about um, when, we, when we hooked those leads up again? Oh, I can't remember. And you're like, okay. And so my, my thing is, you know, obviously when you're doing user studies, you need to uh, have informed consent on anything you record. And sometimes it's not appropriate to have microphones and cameras and people watching and all that sort of stuff you have. If you're doing, you know, for example, medical, if you're dealing with real patients, they might not be comfortable with you recording all this information. But where it is possible to record it, record it. Because I've seen so many students come through and be like, they, they do some statistical analysis and there is one data point which is massively outlier. And they're like, what happened there? And they're like, um, and you're like, this is gonna, I can guarantee your, your examiners are gonna ask you about this because it's like, you have this line which goes like that and then you have one up there and then there. And you're like, what happened there? And they're like, I can't remember. And you're like, go back and look at the things. And they're like, I didn't record it. And you're like, okay. You need to figure out what happened there because that'll be the first thing as a thesis examiner, and I'm an examiner of a few, few theses, theses. As you flick through, you see a graph with one point outlying and they haven't talked about it. You know that something has happened that they are uncomfortable about. And your job as the examiner is to test their knowledge. So if they have deliberately tried to hide something in there, that is what you're going to call them out on. So record everything. You never know. You, you do your user study. Six months later, you're writing your thesis you're not likely to remember exactly what happened in that one session. Why did that person take, you know, five times longer than everyone else? Was it because they were nervous? Were they anxious? Did they go to the toilet and you forgot to stop the stopwatch? You know, these are all things which are super easy to check on later on, but you're very unlikely to remember them six months later when you're, you know, knees deep in writing your thesis and you're like, oh, what happened there? Why is that one data point massively outlying? Um, how you observe and capture the experience, let your user experience don't tell, show don't tell, don't explain. Have them talk through the experience. Again, this is a really useful thing, particularly if you're recording. Um, ask the user to think aloud. Okay, you give them a task. Okay, um, I would like you to open a new account for this person. Can you explain, can you just, as you're doing it, explain what you're doing? Okay, so I'm gonna click on this thing and then I'm gonna click over here and I'm gonna type their, user, type their name in, click here, I'm gonna put in their address, so on and so forth. Then they're like, okay, I'm gonna click here, oh, okay, um, that didn't work. And then, you know, in that case, you can prompt for more information, say, why, why did you think, or why were you planning on clicking there? But just, again, it all comes down to recording as much information as possible because once it's gone, it's gone. Um, actively observe, don't correct mistakes. If the user is completely stuck, you know, they cannot move on at all, you can maybe guide them. But if they're like, they click on it, oh, okay, um, that didn't work. Give them, give them a little bit of time to see if they can figure out why or how they proceed from here. Only if they're like, I, I don't know what's going on, then you might step in and say, okay, we'll click over here. Um, obviously, this is something that I need to work on. And follow up with questions, find out what they think, answer their questions with questions. If they're like, oh, um, how come nothing happened when I clicked on that button? So what do you think what should have happened when you clicked on that button? Turn it around on them. You're, you're trying to figure out why they did the things that they did. You want to get as much information as possible. You don't want to, ideally, you don't want to give them any more information than you absolutely have to because otherwise you are boxing in their mindset. Um, yes, yeah, so we've talked about variables. Identify the variables and build prototypes to test it. Does this go under the bed? Does it go behind the patient? Um, it helps us get a better understanding. Focusing saves energy, not creating all facets. So we're not gonna worry about building out, you know, the, the machine to look perfect. We're just gonna allow you to mount it to the bottom of the bed or the top of the bed and then run through a scenario of where you'd use it to see if I put it under the bed, you know, does it make it really hard if they drop a lead and oh, now I've got to crawl around on a floor which is potentially kind of gross because we're in a hospital to get this lead out from underneath or if I hang it to the wall is it too difficult for me to get the leads you know we're just looking at one thing we're not worried about the fact that okay 
the box is literally like, you know, a cardboard cereal box with pieces of string hanging out the side of it. You know, it doesn't matter that that's all super low fidelity. All we're trying to do is just check. We run through these things and say, if we put it on the wall, is that going to be better than putting it on the floor? We can check that with a bunch of pieces, of like a cardboard box with pieces of string hanging out of it. Oh, and by changing variables, we can create comparison prototypes. So we're going to have two prototypes, and we can compare them side by side, and then we can get actual... Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't super strong in your evaluation statistics, there's two types of feedback we can get, objective and subjective. Um, I always get these around the wrong way. Objective is where it is hard, cold hard facts. Pretty sure. Yeah. So cold, cold hard facts. So my objective thing, it took me five minutes to do it using this way. I, it took me three minutes doing it that way. You know, we can easily measure them. We can throw it into SPSS or some statistical software, get some values out. We can say, this thing is 97% better because, 97% faster, blah, blah, blah. Um, subjective is where we ask the users, yeah, it was faster, but it, you know, it was actually really uncomfortable. I had to really reach out and stretch to get that thing. Um, you know, the, the, the head-mounted display gave me horrific simulator sickness. You can't really put that on a graph. <laughs> okay, you can, you can maybe measure how sick it made them, but, um, and there are, there are all sorts of different measures like the NASA TLX, which me measures task load and all these sorts of things. So you can measure some of these things, but some people may just be like, I just hated it, it was awful. Like, everything about the experience was terrible. Oh, but you were like 20% faster, I don't care. <laughs> you know, so you, you wanna, um, by creating comparison prototypes, allows you to collect both subjective and objective, uh, but the, obviously the objective is super good with the comparison prototypes, because you can literally say, prototype one had a value of 9.3, prototype two had a value of 8.7. By looking at this, we can see statistically, prototype two is better in this metric. Um, testing is failing forward. There is unfortunately a lot of things in here about testing. <laughs> uh, testing is failing forward. You want to make sure that you're investing in time and resources on building the right it before you figure out how to build it right, if that makes sense. So we want to make sure we're, we're designing a solution to the right problem. Uh, the solution we're designing is the right one rather than building the perfect solution for which the user doesn't need, didn't ask for, doesn't want. Um, what looks like a great solution on paper might not work well in practice. What, um, an idea that didn't seem good might turn into a success. The faster you test with real people, the earlier you will know you're on the right path. It's very important. Start, test, evaluate, prototype everything as early as possible. Do not leave anything till the last minute because that's when you'll discover that you have made a fundamental mistake and by then you are, you have one month left to write up your thesis and you do not have time to do another user evaluation. If you ask people what they think of an abstract idea, you're going to get opinions. Um, if you show them a finished idea, you're going to get compliments. <laughs> um, you don't want compliments when you're prototyping something. You want someone to give you some honest feedback. Uh, they might, uh, you make them experience your solution, you'll get usable feedback, so that will make your solution better or discard it. Do not sell your idea. Your idea is not to convince someone your idea is fantastic. With, again, the caveat that if we're in the decision making and it's me versus you, in that case I'm trying to sell my idea. But we're talking about testing at the moment, so if we're with a user, we're not trying to tell them that this is the best idea. We're asking for their honest feedback on what they think about this. Let the tester experience it instead of just showing them. Don't sit at the computer and be like, oh, you can click here and click there. Let them sit at the computer you, sh you tell them enough and then shut up and let them do their thing. Capture the feedback. I hope I've made that clear. Capture the feedback. Um, be open to unexpected outcomes and misunderstandings. If they didn't get your idea, why didn't they? Is it because they are really as dumb as a bag of rocks? Or is your prototype really confusing and unintuitive? Um, that might inform you next iteration. If they've done something you didn't expect, it, there's a good chance it's probably your fault. <laughs> Again, you are always wrong. The user is always right. If they've done something, you're like, oh, that was stupid. Why did they do that? Did, did you not make it clear enough? Or are they, are they I mean, some people are le legitimately just stupid and 
you know, you can't hope to you can't hope to save everyone. But if these are the users who are using your system, if all of them are what you would consider stupid, then maybe you need to make your de your design stupid as well, because they, at the end of the day, they're the people who are paying your invoice. Um, and don't get attached to your prototype. If if you spend a lot of time on it and it's rubbish, well, you've wasted that time. Um, I meant to dig one of these out this morning. I'm pretty sure we've still got some. Is anyone familiar with the Engage? Yep. So the Engage was this is this is pre iPhone and everything. Back when Nokia was still a, a mobile phone powerhouse and not, I don't even know, are they on Android now, I think, because they tried, they boarded with Windows and have more or less, like, completely killed their company. But Nokia brought out the Nokia Engage, which was the fusion of mobile gaming technology with cell phones. And as an engineering, uh, a piece of engineering, it was pretty impressive. It had a really good processor in it, it was able to play 3D games, it was, it was basically a Nintendo DS meets a cell phone before Nintendo DS's existed and all this stuff. It was a great piece of engineering. However, as you can tell by these things, the engineers were looking at it as a game console with a phone in it rather than a phone with a game console in it. And so when they were designing it, their thing was like, oh, well, people still need to make phone calls. So we've got to put a microphone and a speaker in it. And the way they had designed it, the only place the microphone and the speaker could go was in the side. And so you ended up, if you need to make a phone call on your device, so most normal people will hold a phone like that. It seems incredibly petty, but humans are social creatures and we like to conform to social norms. Everyone holds their phone like that when they're talking in it. Everyone wants to. Nokia made you hold the phone like that. And it seems like such a, such a minute thing. It's literally a 90 degree rotation and they got slammed. These devices failed miserably and became, before internet memes were a thing, they were an internet meme. There were entire websites set up to taking photos, mocking how poor the Engage is designed. And it was people like, this guy here obviously has like a massive thing, but there were people with calculators and holding like enormous, like enormous, or they'd have like a phone like this and they'd be holding it up to the side of the head, just mocking it. They say there's no such thing as bad publicity. I don't believe that. This was bad publicity and the Engage tanked. Despite the fact it was actually a really impressive piece of engineering, one minor design flaw sticking the speaker and the microphone in the side killed it. They did release another version later on where they had moved the microphone so you could hold it like that, but the damage was done. Nobody wanted to buy an Engage anymore. So, you know, you feel like that would be something with a small focus group of teens or tweens, people who are most susceptible to uh, peer pressure, get them in there and have them use it. You will get very honest feedback very quickly from a bunch of teenagers about whether your new phone is cool or not. And I think they would have realized very quickly that no one's going to use a phone that makes them look like an idiot. Uh, to a slightly less amusing, slightly more serious note, um, uh, some of you are perhaps old enough to remember this. So 2000, uh, 2000 um, George Bush, Al Gore, George Bush running for the Republicans, Al Gore running for the Democrats. Um, George Bush won, but there was huge controversy around that. There was huge amounts of rec recounts and stuff. Um, so for those of you who don't know about how the American political system works, it's really weird. You have a number of states, and each state has a number of people whose votes actually count. And the idea is, as a person in a state, I cast my vote, and then the people who represent that state are supposed to vote on my behalf. So it'd be like if we all cast our votes, and then our city council, you know, there's, say, 13 people on the city council, and they vote, and they, they cast their votes. But if there's 13, well, let's say 14 to make it easy. If there's 13 people, and 50% vote national, and 50% vote Labour, of those 14 people, 50% should put their votes toward national, 50% should put their votes towards Labour. And that's a very dumbed down version of how it works in the states. So everyone votes, but then there's the electoral colleges and they get the actual votes which count. Um, so to give, uh, give some context, um, there's a few swing states which basically decide whether they get a Republican government or a Democrat government, because most of them you know, will always vote Democrat or Republican, and there's probably about, I think, eight states which flip. And though, you know, it's pretty much 50-50, 
if you count out those eight states, so depending on which way they flip, depends on which government they get, of which one of them is Florida. Um, Al Gore won the county, but George Bush won the state of Florida. So the Republicans won. George Bush won by 537 votes out of 5 million. So that's a, that's a 0.009% of the population he won by. This is the uh, voting ballot. So in this voting ballot, the idea was you were supposed to punch out with a pencil the hole corresponding to the person you wanted to vote for. So down the top, we have Republican George Bush with Dick Cheney as vice president. Uh, Democrats, we have Al Gore with Joseph Lieberman as vice president. Then we have a bunch of other people that no one ever really votes for because it's a two-party system. You either get Democrats or Republicans, you deal with it. So, Republican, punch the first hole, easy. Democrats, second on the chart, punch second hole. You've just voted for the Reform Party. Because as this lines up, and you can sort of see this by the arrows. If you want to vote for Republican, you punch that hole. If you want to vote for the Democrats, you punch that hole. A lot of people found this very confusing. Florida is full of a lot of old people. Might sound a little bit racist, but it's true. Uh, not racist, ageist, sorry, but it's true. Um, and old people don't necessarily always have the best vision and stuff like that. Uh, probably not so much in Florida, but you know, people whose English, a lot of um, you know, uh, Spanish and South American people in the States, probably not so much in Florida, but having things which are slightly confusing um, for people who are already not English as a first language just adds that extra burden onto them of like trying to understand exactly what's happening. And yeah, George Bush won by 537 votes. Um, 4,000 people voted wrong, estimated, so they voted for the reform. Reform had an awesome, uh, awesome election in Florida. They got way more votes than they ever expected to. Uh, they estimated 4,000 of them were probably Democrats who accidentally voted for the 4,000. 4, Keeping in mind, he won by 537 votes. 4,000 voted wrong. 19,000 were invalid because they punched both holes. They punched the reform and they're like, oh, hold on, um, and punched Democrats as well. That's an invalid vote. Your vote gets thrown in the trash. So that's 23,000 people probably wanted to vote for Al Gore, but didn't. George Bush won by 500 votes. This is a terrible example of design. <laughs> and, you know, then the, Iraq, uh, the um, World Trade Center got bombed, the Iraq War happened. A lot, of, a lot of history, American history, probably would have been very different if this had been designed slightly better. I mean, the World Trade Center was not getting blown up, unless you're a conspiracy theorist, it was probably not his fault. The war on terror as a result of that you know, that could have gone very differently with Al Gore, who was predominantly anti-war over George Bush, who um, was not so much. <laughs> cool, so just to wrap up, uh, we're a little bit over time, I apologize about that. Uh, prototyping goals, we wanna learn, we wanna solve disagreements, start a conversation with each other and with our clients, we wanna fail quickly and cheaply, low resolution, test ideas without spending time and money, and we want to manage the solution building process. We want to break a large problem into small parts that we can test. We just want to test, does it make a difference if it's on the wall versus under the bed? We don't want to test the entire system the first time through. Um, this is all stuff we've more or less covered, but uh, build over planning, so don't spend ages planning it. Just whip it together out of a cardboard box and some string, it's fine. Essence over details, figure out what's important about what you're testing. Don't bother building everything. Stay at low resolution and materials to use. The best materials are those that move at the speed of, speed of thought. Um, so things that you can very quickly. I'm sorry, but 3D printing is usually not a good low fidelity prototyping tool because especially without 3D printers, you will spend at least a day trying to get a print which is about that big out of them. Um, and the last thing to consider is all, pro all uh, prototypes involve comp compromises. So if it's software, for example, is it slow because you haven't optimized it yet? For my example, I have just put a white box in place of a button because I'm not testing that. Is there limited functionality? Can you only click on certain things or any certain parts of it work? Uh, there's two main types of compromise. You have a horizontal one where maybe you can click on everything on the website and you can get from the home page, you can see every other page, but if you try and click on a link on that secondary page, you can't go very far. 
very far, it's horizontal, very little detail, but you can sort of get a wide overarching view of everything. Or a vertical compromise where you basically go right down one process and you don't worry about everything else. I want you to create an account on, on the website. You can create an entire account, but if you try and click on anything else, nothing is going to work. And really, the important thing about prototype uh, compromises is they, we can't ignore them. You've got to communicate them to your user. You've got to be aware of them. Just you know, make sure that they're not forgotten about. They're not brushed into a corner. If you want a user to test a certain thing, just say, it's, you can't test everything. We're just looking at this today so that they don't look at your prototype and be like, well, this isn't what I asked for. No, it's not what you're asked for. This isn't the finished product. This is just start stage one. That's today. Any questions? No? Cool. All right. Um, yeah, so I as I as I mentioned, I'm here all